Welcome, everybody. My name is Peter Beer, and I'm so happy to be in a room with wonderful people and celebrating such an exciting evening as Grad Slam of this year. So thank you for being here live. It will be wonderful. Um, so it's the first time here uh, since uh, uh, COVID hit us. And uh, thinking all of you who went through this uh, difficult time, being with your families, with your friends, and here we are. Here we are, hopefully at a better place very soon, and to gather again and to have many more evenings like this one. I'm Peter Beal, the Vice Provost and Dean of uh, the Division of Graduate Studies, and you see it, I'm very nervous. This is my first grad slam. <laughs> and it's my great honor and pleasure uh, to host this event and to learn with you about the important and exciting credit study of eight finalists. It is also my pleasure to welcome a really special welcome to campus provost and executive vice chancellor, Lori Kletzer, <laughs> who, if you remember some of you, in 2019 stood in my place in the very same position. And so we are really, really thankful, uh, Laurie, uh, that you're still with us and especially to stepping in because one judge couldn't come and to be one of our uh, distinguished judges. Thank you very much, Laurie. Thank you again. Thank you. And I will introduce the judges in a second. And, uh, but before I begin, please take a moment to silence your electronic devices, okay? But I hope you can switch them back on because you need them, because we have very important people's choice here, where you at the very end, and you will get signs and everything, switch it up back on and vote. So at the moment, please uh, switch them off. And also, uh, please do not take photographs or videotaping. We have our uh, UC Santa Cruz uh, professional team here. It is live streamed and uh, you can, will be able to watch it very soon on our YouTube channel. So um, I will read, which is, as we all know, extremely important uh, for us here at UC Santa Cruz and in our wonderful city uh, <coughs> in Santa Cruz, uh, the land acknowledgement. And uh, you can see it here on the screens. The land on which we gather is the unsettled territory of the Awashwash speaking Uyibi tribe. The Ama Mutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of the indigenous people taken to the missions uh, Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during the Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. It is today's working hard to restore the traditional stewardship practices of these lands and heal from historical trauma. And please join me now to uh, thanking our judges who are listed on the second uh, page of the uh, program. And I will introduce the judges, uh, but please wait with your uh, applause until we have introduced all of them. And if you could, as judge, uh, uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, stand up uh, so that everybody uh, can, can see you. Uh, it is uh, a very great privilege, and as I just learned, and you hear all my accent, uh, the mayor of this beautiful city where I moved eight months ago from the snowy city of Buffalo actually speaks fluently German and lived in Germany. So here we go, Sonja Brunner. Thank you very much to be here. And then number two is Willie Elliott uh, McCree, the CEO of Second Harvest Food Bank. Thank you. And judging virtually by watching the live stream is uh, Britbal uh, Cayera, uh, the global segment leader of industrial automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning at Intel. Thank you, Britbal. Thank you. And then, uh, of course, again, thank you, Laurie Kletzer, for being our judge as well. Thank you, Laurie. 
then to Bonnie uh, Liskamp, the director of the City of Santa Cruz Economic Development Office. Thank you. Uh, Jacob Martinez, the founder and executive director of Digital Nest. Thank you very much. And Everett O'Keenlin, the exhibitions and project manager at the Santa Cruz uh, Museum of Art and History. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then finally, Christina Waters, contributing editor with Metro Newspaper and Research Associate with UCSC Arts Division. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's a, a really great privilege uh, for our graduate students, for us, and uh, to have you here and uh, spend this wonderful evening with us. Thank you. Um, your program lists another judge, Dr. Maruda uh, Luther Maitra, uh, at uh, a UC Foundation, uh, UCSC Foundation trustee and former professor of economics at, uh, at our university, who had to cancel after our programs uh, went actually in print. But uh, she is very much involved with the Zidata Maitra Memorial Lecture, which is actually tomorrow. So uh, hopefully some of you uh, can join that uh, uh, via, via Zoom, and she really sends her apologies not to be able to be here. So our judges score the finalists based on seven communication criteria. Clarity, organization, delivery, visuals, appropriateness, intellectual significance, and engagement. On a scale from one to five in each, being five the highest score. I feel like back in the classroom again. Yes, okay, great, I love it. Uh, their scores determine our champion and runner-up, but we have another prize uh, that you, both uh, our in-person uh, audience here and our virtual audience watching and live stream, determine the people's choice and how wonderful it is, really, to have everybody engage in this process. After the presentations conclude, you will have the opportunity to text message uh, your vote uh, and Sonia will uh, really keep an eye on that, that, that and Lorado especially, uh, that everything is in order and then you know when you press the button or most importantly, switch on your phone again. And, uh, and then um, um, in the event that your People's Choice winner is the same as either our runner-up or champion, then the finalist takes it all, receives both prizes. So. That's uh, uh, our little guidance here uh, of the competition. Our champion, and that is so important, will represent UC Santa Cruz at the UC system-wide Grad Slam hosted by the University of California Office of the President on May 6 in the beautiful city of San Francisco with Michael Drake, our president, uh, in person there and hosting. And we do really hope that this will be in person. As you all know, Unfortunately, we had to cancel so many things, and I think you all agree, being in person makes a difference. And let's do it, let's do it. So, um, now the question, why does you see uh, the UC Office of the President invest in a grad slam and request that each UC campus graduate division hold a Grad Slam contest. Grad Slam represents one way that the UC system and each campus recognizes and celebrates our valued graduate students and their vital contribution to the university where they teach, conduct research, whether it's in the lab, in the field, in the archive, in the studio, whether they dance or do a microscope, they are our most important part. That's why we are here, our graduate students. Yeah. And I told them all, they should, they're sitting all here and there, they shouldn't be nervous because I'm so much more nervous than them and they're so much more talented here. We cannot wait to have you here, okay? To make that absolutely, absolutely sure. So, um, and, uh, the most important thing is really, if you really look at the uh, uh, at graduate education and how 
important it is for our discoveries of the most pressing issues uh, of nowadays. But one thing is also important, and that's why we're here today, professional development, to giving you the possibility to do the extra thing. Because you're all brilliant, you're all great, you're all fantastic. This extra thing, going in front of an audience and let the audience hear what you have to say about your fascinating research, but mostly you talk to your professor, you talk to your fellow graduate students, and they're all specialists. Here's a time when you say how important your research is, and we are here really helping you to understand that that is really something which we are all so proud of you that you're doing that here. So increasingly, uh, to communicate effectively, meaning convincingly and understandably to a wide variety of audiences, not just colleagues, as I said, fa uh, factors heavily uh, in your career choices and, uh, and your success. But not only do graduate students benefit from participating in Grad Slam and improving their public speaking, UC Santa Cruz and UC and the UC system benefits from offering the public a view in what we do here at UC so well. To overcome town and gown, to really have one community here in Santa Cruz, which is the best place in the world, and where we really research the problems which are really relevant for the broader uh, uh, community in California and in the nation and in the world. And that's why we are here tonight, to bring us together that you see what we do up on the hill. Okay? Yeah. So, and here we have a little lecture. We have uh, five uh, disciplines, and we have almost all disciplines and all divisions here uh, represented. With us here, our uh, division of social sciences, our division uh, of, uh, of uh, the arts, our PBSI, or physical and biological uh, sciences, and of course, our uh, yeah, famous uh, Baskin School of uh, Engineering. And so we are here all today uh, that uh, really we witnessed you are already the winners, so you already won the pre-contact, and this is only the, uh, the, the final little thing that we sent you. We would love to send you all to San Francisco, uh, but uh, uh, that really you, we all know that you already uh, won in the first round. You are pre-selected, and we are very much looking forward uh, to listen to you and really let Give them all an applause that they are no longer nervous. You are the best already. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. To hear the best of the best? Yeah. Good. All right. So our first presenter is uh, Andrea Paz Lakevo. And she is a second year master's student in coastal science and policy and is conducting her final capstone project on kelp forest restoration in Baia, California. And believe it or not, she drove up here 10 hours to be with you tonight and present her research. Andrea, come on stage. That fishing boat used to belong to my proud grandfather, standing over there. Fishing used to be our family's business, but it collapsed in the 90s because of political and environmental challenges called the tuna embargo. This event left us, along with many other families, with no source of income. As I began my studies and slowly developed a career as part of a team of multidisciplinary scientists, I learned that our vast oceans provide 10 to 12% of the world's population income and protein source and that one of the most productive systems in temperate regions are kelp forests. They're the sanctuary of a number of fish and mollusks and a system that fishers depend on. But I also learned that kelp forests were slowly decaying due to climate change and other human-related impacts. In managing that other families would have to suffer the same fate as we did in the same coasts not long ago was a hard pill to swallow, but also an inspiration. I realized that as global challenges become more complex, we need to come up with simpler solutions. This is why I founded Spora. 
Soci ecology and planning for optimal restoration of algae is a multidisciplinary binational program. We're dedicated to restoring giant kelp alongside fishing communities, starting off in the Mexican Pacific. Right now, we're deploying the first green gravel pilot for giant kelp. But what is green gravel and why do we need it? Well, green gravel is a revolutionary method focused on the reforestation of this ecosystem. And honestly, it's one of the most logical solutions to address kelp loss because it could reduce the cost of reforestation without the need of highly trained workers. What we do is take microscopic kelp spores and place them in small rocks or gravel. Once we share the algae are happily growing and attached to the gravel, we give to fishermen to throw into the ocean, and voila, a new kelp forest could be on its way. Of course, in practice, the process is a bit more complex, but it could provide fishing communities with a relatively simple method for the reforestation of their underwater forest. Spora is not only my master's project at UCSC, but a vision shared by multiple stakeholders, such as local international researchers with expertise in kelp culturing, ecology, and genomics. Local international NGOs supporting kelp rest restoration efforts, as well as community engagement. We even got the support of the local museum and aquarium, Caracol, driven to educate local population about kelp loss. And of course, our direct beneficiaries, the local fishing communities. We're all working towards a shared goal, to prove that green gravel can be a scalable solution to jumpstart and future-proof our kelp forest, and do so in an accessible way, so that any community can seed their own kelp forest. I hope this talk convinces you to support this cause. Once again, this is Pora. Thank you very much. Wow, I had, I had to sit there because, correct, I mean, to look at the slides and all that. Really Thank fantastic. You. So, um, we do a little interview because the judges need some time also to write their, um, um, you know, what think about the talk. And uh, so, let me just ask you, how was the drive up here? It was long, but <laughs> gladly I shared it with my partner. So, we had a lot of fun podcasting and yeah, Excellent. speaking out. So, and how, how, how did you decide on this very particular topic? Uh, and uh, what do you think comes next? Yeah, well, I've been diving the Mexican Pacific for around seven years now, and we hit, there was a huge marine heat wave that consumed part of California's and the Mexican Pacific Coast kelp forest. And we have not seen it back as it used to be. So, I learned about this kelp restoration technique and it made a lot of sense, so it was only logical for me to try and pursue it and, yeah, trying to make it uh, accessible to the communities because there's a great potential for adoption as they, we have a bottom-up management, fishing communities uh, manage their own ecosystems, not so much from the government perspective, and yeah, we could make, apply it on the field much quicker, so. Fantastic. Yeah. Can I ask you about your grandfather? Yeah, please. So uh, her grandfather was a fisher. And uh, tell us a little bit about you know, how he influenced you in regard to really falling in love with the ocean and doing really what you're so passionate about. Yeah, it was actually a coincidence that it took me a little while to realize that I was also so interested in coastal systems. And yeah, the collapse of the fishery it was like a direct impact on the community's income, like not just our family, like multiple families had to diversify. And yeah, we lived through the collapse of the fishery and we needed to adapt and we know people then. Like we even find them in the stores like, hey, I used to work with your grandfather. And yeah, realizing that there's so many communities that depend on this kelp forest to, for their income in remote areas when there's nothing else. Um, yeah, it's really inspiring. How proud must your family be of you? Really fantastic. So you're a climber. So you're climbing really already getting a wonderful uh, degree here at this university. So tell us about your climbing experiences. My climbing? Climbing, you know? Oh, cli literally climbing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just look, brother. <laughs> yeah, I really love climbing. And just it's a bit of like a meditation system where, I mean, like in diving, you need to be really aware of the security and 
also being able to enjoy it. It's extreme sports that I like. So now we want to have one more thing. What's your dream job? My dream job. That Spora progresses and that it can become an NGO or a company that provides green gravel and that we can have like a benefit cost analysis of the solution so it's scalable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Andrea. You. Right, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Our next uh, presenter, Amanda Quirk, is a fifth year uh, PhD candidate in astronomy and astrophysics. And she will tell us about mergers of galactic proportions. Welcome, Amanda. If we were to truly study a galaxy's life, we would need billions of years to watch it form and grow. Now that is way longer than I plan on being in graduate school. <laughs> so to figure out how galaxies change over time, astronomers like me have to act more like archaeologists. We look for clues that represent a tiny snapshot into a galaxy's history. Now, a whole lot can happen to a galaxy in billions of years. There are violent bursts of star formation, energetic deaths of massive stars, and collisions between galaxies. I'm particularly interested in those collisions called galaxy mergers or galactic cannibalism. Mergers tear apart smaller galaxies while feeding larger ones. They can completely change the way a galaxy looks and behaves, so they are a critical part of a galaxy's evolution. I look for signs of mergers in two nearby beautiful galaxies, Andromeda and Triangulum. To study these galaxies, I use one of the largest telescopes on Earth to observe stars in them. You see, the thing about stars is their gossips. They give away many of their secrets just through their light. With cutting-edge technology, we can measure how fast a star is moving while we are millions of miles away. I use this to compare how fast the young and the old stars are moving. If there's a difference, then we think that something must have happened to the galaxy in the time between when the young and the old stars were born. And that something just could be a merger. Using this technique, I found that the Andromeda galaxy likely had a major merger in the past four billion years. Now, this is relatively recent and actually changes what we know about the kinds of mergers spiral galaxies can survive. It also calls into question its interaction history with its smaller neighbor, Triangulum. So for the past four years, I've been observing stars in Triangulum, and I've found that there's not much difference between how the young and the old stars are moving. This suggests that, so far, Triangulum has been left alone by Andromeda and by other smaller galaxies that have passed by recently. But it won't stay that way forever. Triangulum will collide with Andromeda in billions of years. And it's actually not the only one. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is also on a crash course to colliding with Andromeda in the far future. We won't be around to watch that merger, but the work I'm doing today does give us a glimpse into the future of our own galactic home. Thank you. That was scary. <laughs> And you used archaeology. I'm actually an archaeologist, so and I thought I'm doing boring stuff 10,000 years ago. Billions of years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, we got you beat in astronomy. <laughs> so tell us, how did you get into this particular topic? So there's a planetarium in my hometown. I'm from just outside of Atlanta. And the first time I went and actually to the observatory there and saw Saturn in a telescope, I thought that someone had put a sticker on the other end of the telescope. It just looked so perfect like we see in textbooks that I couldn't believe we were actually seeing the planet. And that memory has never left me and inspired me so far. <laughs> wow, good. And so, again, anthropologists, you're using a lot of anthropological terms, <laughs> cannibalism. So 
Is that in your field accepted that you do those things? <laughs> it is very common amongst galaxies to cannibalize each other. In fact, it's so important. That's how we have the galaxy that we have today. It ate a bunch of smaller galaxies over billions of years. We can see remnants of them in the outer part of the galaxy. But without these mergers, we wouldn't be here today. Okay, good. <laughs> Your dream job when you finish and get the best PhD ever. <laughs> yeah, I would simply love to teach at the college level. I really love sharing astronomy with others. I think everyone can think about their place in the universe and how we got here, and I think that's really special. And tell us now about snorkeling. Snorkeling, so as Because I you go <laughs> under, you know, that's yes. different. You look normally <laughs> up, but here. Yes, I try to remember to admire the world around me, too, instead of just looking up at space. But I'm very fortunate um, to use the Keck telescope, which is on Mauna Kea, which is a very sacred site for the indigenous Hawaiian community. And so while I'm there, I get the opportunity to snorkel with some amazing creatures like manta rays, which is my absolute favorite to do. Wonderful. And our favorite here is... Not to think about our future, but uh, wonderful and great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Eight billion years ago, so uh, not ago, but in, in the future. So don't worry. Um, so our third presenter is Melissa Marimi uh, Schwegal, and she is a fourth year PhD candidate in education with an emphasis in sociology. And she has taught some uh, of the most underserved and vulnerable children in our society, those who are in uh, incarcerated. She will tell us about how she's working to improve their educational outcomes with, their, uh, with her graduate work. Please join me uh, to welcome here, Melissa. During the last four years of my 20-year career as a teacher in public high schools in a Midwestern city, I taught teenagers at a county juvenile detention center. About a week or two before winter break, during my first school year at the detention center, a 16-year-old student in our class was yanked from the juvenile detention facility and placed in the county's adult jail. Legal processes, commonly referred to as transfer laws, exist in all 50 states and allow prosecutors to charge thousands of young people each year as if they are adults for crimes allegedly committed while aged 17 or younger, even though all available evidence indicates that these transfer practices do more harm than good. The student forced from our class that December was 15 years old at the time of his alleged illegal behavior. I was heartbroken. This genial teen had spent the prior three months enthusiastically earning high school credits in our class, yet he did not have access to any educational services or opportunities for an entire year while captive in the adult jail and waiting for his case to be resolved. Furthermore, this teen, a significant amount of teens at the juvenile detention facility and thousands of incarcerated young people across the United States have individual education programs, or IEPs, in accordance with federal civil rights protections for students with disabilities under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, which attempts to ensure that everyone receives access to a free, appropriate public education through age 21. In locally operated adult jails across the United States, county officials and personnel continuously disregard protections afforded through the idea. Of course, there's also always resistance by those whose rights are being violated, like the young people whose experiences compelled me on this journey. In my research, I use historical, legal, and activist archival data and narratives, along with critical and intersectional frameworks, to illustrate the broad contradictions between the idea's intentions and how its implementation is interpreted, enacted, manipulated, or nullified with regard to young people being held in adult jails. The research also supports an understanding of childhood and other categorizations such as disability as shifting and invented constructs. I'm interested in the limitations and potentialities of the idea and this issue of educational access in adult jails as a component of movements for transformative justice, abolition litigation, and local level decarceration. 
Importantly, what I investigate and report represents the lived experiences of those affected by carceral systems and institutions. The student mentioned at the beginning of this presentation did manage to graduate from high school in May of 2021, but it took coalitional efforts and his relentless persistence for seven years. It does not have to be like this. They can lead us to something better, and those affected can also lead us to something more equitable and just. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, your work. And um, I think we all share uh, the being touched about uh, uh, looking into this part. And uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, so clearly the question comes to mind. Why are you interested in, in this particular topic? Uh, what was the journey, the word you used early on, to this particular topic? Right, I was very unfamiliar with um, how education in carceral systems operated until I began teaching in one and I began teaching in a detention center because I was about to quit teaching entirely after 16 years. Um, we had been fighting things like high stakes testing and merit pay and the expansion of charter schools without any sort of um, regulations and um, I was reached out to by the district's principal and they asked me to interview for a position at the County Juvenile Detention Center. So I ended up staying and teaching for four more years and um, grew very passionate about the issues there as I was about education before I taught there. And what is your dream job after that? Um, Probably now it's something that hasn't even been imagined at this point. Something um, beyond, yeah, after abolition and uh, systems that don't even exist yet that I could contribute to in some way. Wonderful. So our kids go to the same school, right? Uh, Santa Cruz High. So uh, yes, and yes. your son gets a diploma, and you have. Uh, other three kids and uh, tell us a little bit about your family and how you manage really which is so fantastic to work so hard and and have a, a wonderful <laughs> family yeah well they definitely inspire and motivate me and i am very blessed to have the four of them and three of them here oh wonderful yeah. <laughs> sorry to call you out yeah yeah, right. they're definitely all of the joy and happiness in my life. The greatest moments, anyway, have come from interactions and events with them. Congratulations, and thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Amanda uh, Caballal, and uh, she's a fourth, uh, fourth year uh, PhD candidate. Uh, in uh, biology and uh, with a track in biomedical uh, science and engineering and works on discovering ways to overcome pathogen resistance to uh, in uh, particular medicines. And now we hear more about that. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. So if the current global pandemic that we're in has taught us anything, it's that microbes hold immense power. Now, I don't study viruses, but I study their cousin, the microbe bacteria, specifically E. coli, through the lens of antibiotic resistance. Experts in the field of public health Microbiology and epidemiology have made a harrowing prediction that by the year 2050, more people will die from antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections than all cancers combined. In order to come up with a solution to this problem, myself and my lab, the CAMPS lab over at UC Santa Cruz, study clinical samples derived from patients throughout the United States in order to come up with a solution. Now, mutations are very powerful, but generally speaking, they are also benign. They can also be benign. Right? Mutations are what allow E. coli these special powers to 
overcome the drug mechanism of action. And so what I do specifically is I use technology like whole genome sequencing to make a map of all of the mutations and their locations in each of these clinical strains. And what I do is I try to understand how each of these mutations specifically contributes to this problem. And so if we're thinking about mutations like X-Men, they have these special powers, but I need to test them out to see exactly how they're able to overcome the drugs. And so I use a very diverse set of chemical compounds, including the current arsenal of antibiotics available to map out how these mutations work. In addition to that, we also work with medicinal chemists so that we can derive novel formulas to create these antibiotics that can overcome the special powers that these genetic mutations confer these bacteria. The great thing about E. coli and their mutations is that by also studying this specific strain, we can learn more about other types of pathogens since they follow a lot of the same patterns and are genetically conserved in many ways. And so by combining our special ability to do whole genome sequencing and basic science at the wet lab bench, we are able to stay one step ahead of the next predicted global pandemic. Thank you so much. So me. I, I, I just want to stay there all the time and listen and think, and, uh, and I'm sure everybody here, um, you know, wants to ask, ask you questions because clearly you do something which we all, well, every day we think about. And uh, so, um, how got you interested in this really particular topic? And uh, and I'm sure you go to uh, go back to your family, go to parties, and everybody asks you about, you know are we on the right track with COVID and you know, where's the future? And then you just made this comment that uh, about cancer. And uh, um, um, so talk to us a little bit, how you got interested in it and how do you live with it in your community? Right, and so I think what got me interested in studying microbiology is the special relationship that we have with bacteria, right? We are literally comprised of bacterial cells within us and on us. And we have this very special quid pro quo relationship with them that is so delicate. And so where anything can disrupt it. And I really was fascinated by that because I thought if that's, if that's the balance that's keeping us in check, I can think of a billion things that can move it into either direction. And how are we still functioning? Um, and so that idea kind of drove me to um, study this in, as, through the PhD program. Perfect. And uh, well, here's one of our students who really, uh, like all of our students, but this is so clear that interdisciplinarity works at our university because that's where the discovery is. It's not just medicine. It's not just biology or engineering. It is all together. Could you talk a little bit about your training in this interdisciplinary framework? Absolutely. So people ask me how I would define myself, and I find that to be very challenging because I do computer programming, I do molecular biology, I do microbiology, um, I do structural chemistry, I look at proteins, right? The list goes on and on, and I think that we're starting to discover that science is not, it is a niche, but it's also so much more because we cannot study something so specific without considering every aspect, every angle, and that includes all these other pieces that other experts um, come to help us with. Perfect. But you're also an expert in writing and something we all interested to do again, dancing. Tell us about your dance and are you performing at the moment? Are you able? Yes. Um, I feel that I'm an artist at the end of the day. But um, yes, I love to write and I love to dance and I do it. Um, it's very therapeutic, but I also do it competitively and I also teach it. 
Um, and I like that I can develop creativity and also do something physically um, challenging so that I can, um, you know, stay balanced and, uh, you know, stay on top of exercise as well because doing a PhD can be very stressful. We heard you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ontario Alexander. He's a first year PhD candidate in musicology, and he's going to tell us his effort to revive and the interest in the 18th century singer and polymath, Joseph Boulogne. Elvis Presley, The Eagles, Whitney Houston, Bob Dylan, The Beatles, Michael Jackson. Think of the biggest names in the history of music in our lifetimes. Has a hearing a song ever brought back a memory or taken you to a certain place in time in your life? Yes, music has the power to do that. A lyric. A melody, beautiful harmonies can transform a mood, define a generation, connect us. With the sound of our voice or the punch of a finger, we can instantaneously summon the music that we want to hear. But what if, for future generations, the music that we love would be lost and never heard again? Case in point, Joseph Boulogne de Xavier du Saint George. Imagine, if you will, a cool, breezy morning on a Caribbean island. A seven-year-old child clenches the hand of his white father. As they hastily move towards a ship, that child looks back for a glimpse of his mother, a black woman, a slave. And looking back, He doesn't know it, but he's marching toward this ship, and he is leaving the comforts of the world that he knows. He is headed to Paris, a world that will shape him as much as he will shape it. You know Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, and you've heard their music, if only in your childhood cartoons. Well, in 18th century Europe, there was a man whose music rang forth in concert halls, whose star power equaled that of many of the other notable artists of his time. His command of the violin set a standard that's hard to emulate today. As composers, Mozart and Beethoven found inspiration in him. His command of that violin is still hard for many artists to perform today. Yet, his name has been forgotten. And music wasn't the only thing that he was good at. He was a commander in the Revolutionary Army of France, and he led soldiers through battles victoriously. And as a champion, undefeated fencer, he toured England. Yet, many don't know who he is today. But my work as a musicologist is to ensure that future generations know that his music His work is taught in our classrooms, and it never dies from our collective memory. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I learned now from you, and I can't wait for your PhD to be important and to be really showing what you really are passionate about and bringing that in one line with the other composers we, uh, we, we all know. Um, but how did you find that individual? Uh, well, I was taking a class when I was at Cal State LA and I glanced through a book and I saw this picture and I said, who is he? I've never seen him before. <laughs> And so from there, it sparked an interest. And then when I came here, I took a class, and a professor suggested, she said, do you know uh, Joseph Boulogne? 
And I said, ah, I'm kind of familiar with him. And so from there, I've started to uh, put together the research. So do you have already a contract with Netflix? No, I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> So, I mean, do you, where do you see your career from here? You know, clearly, you're at the very beginning of the journey of a PhD. It's a really long journey. But do you see maybe, especially in a topic like that, some other venues for you to fulfill your dream? Well, the ultimate goal is to become a professor in the university. This summer, I will be going to Paris for intensive language study in, Fran in French, and I will also uh, be doing archival research while I'm there. Wow. So, um, and you play music as well? I sing and play the piano. Do you want to sing something? <laughs> 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 oh my God, on the spot. Oh, oh my God, what do I say? Oh, Lord, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you can. And, uh, but uh, um, we would like to thank you very much, really, to bringing, you know, not just for three minutes. I'm sure some of you have already looked at Wikipedia and really maybe tried to find some music. Thank you for your discovery. Thank you for your passion. And good luck, uh, pour Paris. Ça c'est une bonne ville. Thank you. I love this job here. I mean, this is like, I mean, these students, colleagues, friends, discoverers, amazing. So, um, our sixth presenter, six already, right? I mean, it's just the time is flying. Sarah Gonzalez, and she is a six-year PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, and she, as we heard early on from our very first candidate, she's interested in giant kelp. And she uh, will tell us something how that is connected to genetics. Sarah. See ya. Toothpaste ice cream, probiotic capsules. Can you guess what secret ingredient all of these things have in common? Seaweed. Actually, a specific type of seaweed called kelp. Natural chemicals from kelp are used in these everyday products and more. It's one of the main reasons that kelp is harvested and cultivated around the world. So what makes these kelp chemicals so special? Well, kelp live in the ocean, so they need to be able to withstand the force of waves. It helps to be strong, but also flexible. And these same properties are useful for making products that need a gelling or emulsifying component. Giant kelp is the largest, most widespread kelp. <laughs> Giant kelp is the largest, most widespread kelp. But despite its prevalence, a mystery has gone unsolved in this species. It takes on a different shape in different places across its global range. But to see these different shapes, you have to dive down to the bottom of the ocean, where the kelp are anchored to rocks. These anchoring structures are called the holdfast, and sometimes it looks like the picture on the left, <laughs> this large mounding cone shape. But sometimes it looks like the picture on the right, a long strap-like structure that snakes along the rocks. And these two different shapes give rise to two very different looking forests, one that is clumped or one that is continuous. So why does this single species take on different shapes? That's what I wanted to figure out for my PhD. So I went down to Chile, where the locations of these two forms are well documented, and I worked with some amazing researchers and kelp harvesters to find the best access points for diving for kelp. I collected kelp from over 2,000 kilometers of the country's coastline. Then I extracted their DNA and analyzed their chemical compositions. Then I performed an experiment in the ocean, right here off the coast of central California, where I grew up both forms from their tiny microscopic early life stage, all the way up to adulthood, reaching nine meters tall. 
my research found complete genetic separation between these two forms, and that even when you grow them up in the same place, they maintain their distinct forms, either cone-shaped or strap-like. Also, their chemical structures differed in one of their most commercially important chemicals, called alginates, making each type of kelp suitable for different products depending on whether the material needs to be more elastic or more rigid. So overall, these two kelp forms look different. They exist in different forms. They have different evolutionary histories, and their alginate structures are different. What we have been considering as one kelp species out there in the ocean is actually two, with different properties that influence where they grow, how they look, and how we interact with them every day. Thank you so much, and uh, sorry about the little uh, yeah. hiccups. Uh, no worries. No, no, no. This is no worries. It was our fault, and. Uh, uh, no problem at all. So, um, tell us how you got into it. And clearly, I love this photo. You, you <laughs> so, tell us about your passion. Why this topic? Yeah, well, what I really love about kelp is that it has such an importance in marine ecosystems, providing a habitat for lots of fish and other marine creatures. But it also plays this really important role in human societies by providing these chemicals for different products and even the kelp itself used as food, as fertilizer, as biofuel. So I really like that aspect. And give us hope that we can restore and keep it, that it's not disappearing. Yeah, there's lots of efforts out there trying different methods. We heard one earlier from Andrea about ways to restore kelp forests. I think it's really fascinating. I also think kelp aquaculture is really interesting, a way to produce lots of kelp biomass for these different products. Um, I think there's a lot of hope there for kelp for the future. And how is it to be actually a person on the microscope and in the ocean? You know, So can you tell us a little bit about the theory and the, uh, the method and the practice of your research? Definitely. I love that my research takes me out into the field and also lets me work in the lab. I get to go scuba diving and also examine these kelp up close in the microscope. And so because they have this huge uh, life history where they start microscopic and then become so huge, it's, it's cool to be able to observe them in different forms. And which uh, color you have already in your taekwondo? Oh, my, my belt. I have a second degree black belt. So, great, 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 great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, it's my great pleasure to introduce Elise Dufour, and uh, she's a third year PhD student in psychology, and she studies politeness and uh, how informants our increasing interaction with and reliance upon artificial agents like Amazon's Alexa. And uh, here we go. Welcome, Elise. <laughs> Voice assistant technology is advancing at a rapid rate. We have them in our homes, via Alexa, Google, in our cars, even when we call up the grocery store. So if we're going to continue to work with and depend on this technology, we need to ensure that it can communicate effectively with everyone. And part of that communication is making a polite request. Imagine that you need to troubleshoot a problem with your computer. And you ask your Alexa what you need to do. The Alexa needs to tell you to turn the computer off and on again. But how the Alexa says that will have a big impact on how you perceive that request. For example, if she says something like, let's try turning the computer on and off again. This is an example of a positive politeness strategy, and it evokes feelings of cooperation and desirability. Or she could say something like, if it's not too much trouble, can you turn the computer off and on again? This is an example of a negative politeness strategy, and it'll evoke feelings of autonomy and the freedom to refuse a request. But how do we know which one to choose? Previous research tells us that there are several factors, such as power differences, which is like 
talking to your friend versus talking to your boss. Social distance, which is like talking to your friend versus talking to a stranger. And imposition level, which is like asking for $20 versus $200. But what we don't know is if context impacts this decision. Nor do we know if the feelings that are evoked by these politeness strategies are evoked consistently. My research explores these very questions. So I have found that in a task context, like trying to solve a problem, we find that positive politeness is both more effective and strongly evokes these feelings of cooperation and desirability. Negative politeness, not so much. But if we look at a social context, like playing icebreaker questions, then we find negative politeness evoking these strong feelings of autonomy and freedom to refuse a request. Positive politeness, not so great here. In some, we're seeing positive politeness, great in task contexts, and negative politeness, much stronger in social contexts. But what does that mean for voice assistants? Well, let's think of the previous example. The Alexa needs to tell you to turn the computer off and on again to solve a problem. So saying, let's try turning the computer off and on again, is going to be more effective because it's a positive politeness strategy. Matching the right strategy with the right context is key to have effective communication and have an enjoyable conversation with your Alexa. Thank you for your attention. Hey Siri, how are you? No. So. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, same question. You know, I would like to ask everybody, how did you get in this really amazing research? Well, that's actually kind of a funny story, to be honest. Um, part of it is due to COVID um, and having to make a quick pivot on my research. But really what kind of sparked it is one day, my Alexa told me to have a good afternoon. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and so I was like, all right, well, what about this politeness thing? Like, it was kind of cool. I kind of liked it, but it was weird. And so I was like, let's, let's explore it and see how it works. Great. And how, would <laughs> and how about an internship, you know, over, over the hill there? Would that be something? That is definitely something um, I've been interested in. Um, I've been kind of waiting. I've been really developed in this, um, this politeness research, and it is something I'm looking forward to. I'm very interested in user experience research, um, and I would like going into industry. Like, that'd be really cool. Um, I know you haven't asked me, but one of the things I'm really passionate about is making a social artificial agent. So, like, you can actually talk to your Alexa and have a conversation. Like, how cool would that be? <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Do, do you speak to your plants? Uh, She's yes. a plant lover, so... Yes, um, I do. I, I, <laughs> I'm polite to my plants. <laughs> I've got some little Venus flytraps and some pitcher plants, and I, I am polite to them to encourage them to grow <laughs> and to catch all the bugs that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You. Okay, number eight. It's a great pleasure. Our final candidate is Jessica Kendall-Barr, and she's a fifth-year PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology who's been tracking what happens when elephant seals sleep at sea, okay? And uh, we want to hear about that. Jessica. The second you close your eyes, the chatter of your brain becomes slower and louder, creating large, slow waves. Later in the night, your brain starts buzzing again. Your eyes dart back and forth, and your body becomes paralyzed. This is REM sleep, where you dream. Now, you might be thankful not to act out your dreams, but you're safe in your bed. What about an animal, a seal, at sea? For them, their decision to sleep means that they miss out on all the tasty fish floating by and that they might lose control of their body while a shark swims by. For my PhD, I wanted to find out how do marine mammals survive and sleep at sea. 
Now, you might have heard that dolphins have this really cool trick where they can turn off only half of their brain at a time, allowing them to swim and breathe while they sleep. Seals, on the other hand, have to sleep just like us, with both halves of their brain, shutting it off completely. Think about what that means for a seal at sea. But there was a problem. <laughs> Previous sleep studies with marine mammals all relied on captive animals and invasive methods. For my PhD, I wanted to create a gentler method that would work in the wild. So I built this non-invasive sleep recording device. I soldered hundreds of wires, and I tested 25 brands of adhesive, some of them on my own body. <laughs> Finally, we had a device that was ready to record sleep at sea. We found that seals slept almost half the day on land, but at sea, they needed to feed around the clock to support their large body mass, constraining sleep down to less than two hours a day. Still, to understand sleep at sea, I needed one more tool. So I built a custom 3D animation pipeline to visualize her underwater behavior. You can see Heidi here swimming down, starting to glide, go into slow wave sleep, and then, as the sleep paralysis of REM takes over, she flips upside down and starts to spin, falling like a leaf. So next time, when you're safe in your bed, imagine all we could learn from the seals sleeping just like us, but in little naps, 600 feet below the surface, while their predators circle overhead. Thank you very much. Really, really fascinating. <laughs> so, and uh, who did help you build those uh, equipment? I mean, uh, YouTube, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of generous friends who um, sat down and watched me solder. <laughs> Fantastic, because you know, if something doesn't exist, that's where the discovery starts and where the outreach starts. And uh, this is uh, really, and then the visualization, you know, uh, uh, fantastic. So. Are there moments in your life when you think, oh my God, I will never get this PhD because it will not work out? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like the first time my tag exploded or the second time? <laughs> so in the process of you know, designing a tag, you consult engineers who you trust because you know, they do this as a profession, um, but they don't always know the right answers. And uh, we were testing something in a pressure chamber that someone said, oh yeah, for sure, that's bulletproof glass. That'll totally work to the depths that an elephant seal goes to. And it imploded <laughs> very spectacularly, <laughs> but it's good that we tested it. Um, yeah, that was one of those moments. <laughs> and these are for the audience who is not teaching at U uh, UC Santa Cruz or is not taking classes. That is a wonderful thing, being a graduate student, right? Trial and error, having the advisor, <laughs> telling you it will work at some point, and then walking out with this beautiful uh, PhD and changing the world, and in this case, uh, so important, uh, uh, the, uh, the life of those wonderful animals. What is your, what's your dream job? Um, so I gave a talk at Pixar this week. Oh. <laughs> um, so I don't know. We'll see what happens there. But for now, I'm sticking with academia. Um, <laughs> and I'm starting a postdoc in the summer. Uh, and I hope to combine animation and data to understand the connection between humans and the natural world. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I don't want to be on your seat now. I do not want to judge this. I think these are amazing students with amazing topics, and you are all superstars. One more applause. So now some uh, technicalities. Uh, while the judges get their score in, 
Uh, you can also now, right, give the uh, Lorado. Is that okay? They give now uh, the in, both in the live stream as well as um, on your phones. Switch your phones back on and vote. The people's choice here. And you have five minutes to text your vote for one presenter. Take your time. And think again, the audience, about this wonderful presentation here. And uh, enjoy judging. Thank you, judges. I mean, thank you, folks, online and here to vote. It's actually so close. I mean, it's just like, as you all know, OK? All right. Good. Um, so the first uh, award, and I'm actually very happy to, to say also that this not just come with honor and a line on your CV, but also uh, <clears throat> with a little award, monetary award. So the first, um, the People's Choice Award uh, has a nice check of $700, which is not bad. Oh, 750 <laughs> Sorry. I thought I heard seven. OK. And uh, it's really, I'm really happy. And again, this is extremely um, tight. Number one in People's Choice is Melissa Marini Swiggles. And now also we want to see this family stand up because I couldn't see it before. Please stand up, family. Bravo, bravo. And now we have to look into that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Now, the second place for our judges was a, and I'm looking at you, that I got that right, $1,500? $1,500, second place. And again, it was so awfully close. Second place go to Jessica Kendall Barr. <laughs> Jessica. goes to all of you, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, but number one goes to Amanda Quirk. <laughs> With a nice check of $3,000. Yeah. I didn't, $3,000 comes with it. So um, this is amazing, and um, I thank you, all judges, audiences coming out here, being together, celebrating the talent we have here at UC Santa Cruz and the wonderful city of Santa Cruz. Thank you all very, very much. And if you could stay for one second, because we want to see them all. But not in the program and my script and all that. I really would like to acknowledge my team. And, uh, and I name them now. They don't like that. They tomorrow get nasty emails and all that. But they deserve it. They worked so hard, creative team. I start with Jennifer Kasha. If you could just stand up, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. <laughs> Stephanie, sorry. <laughs> Stephanie Kasha. 
Thank you, Stephanie Lorado Anderson. Thank you very much. Don Smith, thank you so much. And Veronica Larkin, thank you. And Rachel Newman. And you know who all this put together? Sonia, here he is. Come on, come on stage, come on stage, come on stage. So we take photos and uh, I thank you very much again and I'm sure you cannot wait for next year, maybe even without vaccination cards, without uh, masks and all back to normal, let's hope. Thank you very much, thank you.